Austin Pitts, and the title of my working paper is From Heroes to Villains, The Lives of Gay Federal Employees, 1947 to 1956. Thank you for having me. Uh, Starting in the 1940s, the United States began characterizing gays in government service as national security threats due to the emerging fear that foreign enemies were attempting to compromise the nation from within. The rationale went that if a foreign agent connected a government employee to homosexuality, the agent would be able to blackmail the employee due to fear of the potential backlash of such a revelation, as the general populace considered gays to be, quote unquote, repulsive, immoral, criminal, and even medically deviant. The government's fear of blackmail compounded when considering those in a, quote unquote, sensitive or influential government position as they possess the potential to real government, reveal government secrets. Interesting, interestingly enough, however, is the apparent lack of personal conviction by many uh, notable government figures during the period that gays were actually quote unquote repulsive or quote unquote immoral. Rather than publicly attack gay federal employees as religious abomination, those in power often condemned them either due to political pressure or to cover suspicions of their own sexuality. In this paper, I will cover both the political and personal views of Harry Truman, Joseph McCarthy, and Dwight Eisenhower regarding gay federal employees. The hysteria that David K. Johnson coined the Lavender Scare apex during the Truman administration. Three days following the conclusion of World War II, a clerk for the Soviet embassy to Canada in Ottawa defected with documents outlining the Soviet Union's espionage in North America. The Guzinko affair, as it would be called, awakened the people of North America to the magnitude and danger of Soviet espionage, was, quote, and was the beginning of the Cold War for public opinion. This allowed Republicans to call the Truman administration, quote, unquote, weak on communism, and claimed that federal agencies were rife with communism. In response, Truman implemented Executive Order 9835, which allowed loyalty boards to perform background checks on federal employees to guarantee that, quote unquote, maximum protection be afforded to the United States against infiltration of disloyal persons into the ranks of its employees. Despite the order, however, Truman himself never appeared overly concerned about communist infiltrating the government. Clark Clifford, a political advisor to Truman, stated, it was a political problem. Truman was going to run in 48, and that was it. The president didn't attach fundamental importance to the so-called communist scare. He thought it was a lot of baloney, but political pressures were such that he had to recognize it. Truman's apathy towards the communist scare would reemerge during his presidential campaign the following year. In July, the House of Un-American Activities Committee, in other words, HUAC, oversaw a hearing to discuss, quote unquote, an underground communist conspiracy that was infiltrating the ranks of American government. The first witness, Elizabeth Bentley, was a Connecticut woman who previously confessed to spying for the Soviet Union. Bentley joined the Communist Party USA in the late 1930s as a quote unquote average run of the mill member and later developed relationships with government employees. She utilized these relationships to quote unquote furnish political, military, whatever information to the members of the Communist Party who she did believe were Soviet agents. By the conclusion of the hearing, Bentley, quote unquote, had named 28 government officials and employees who had served her information, including Lachlan Curry, a former Roosevelt assistant, and Harry Dexter White, a former assistant secretary of the Treasury. The committee heard next from Whitaker Chambers, a Time Magazine editor, three days following Bentley's testimony to substantiate her claims. Chambers, who joined the communist movement in New York City in 1924, claimed to be part of a sect that, quote unquote, aimed to infiltrate ranks of American government. He stated, the Communist Party exists for the specific purpose of overthrowing the government at the opportune time by any and all means, and each of its members, by the fact that he is a member, is dedicated to this purpose. 
When asked about known members, Chambers' list included Lee Pressman, John Apt, and Alger Hiss. The former two were notable figures in Henry Wallace's presidential campaign, while Hiss ranked near the top of the State Department and served as the Secretary General of the San Francisco Conference. Perhaps most important, however, was Hiss's close relationship with President Truman. Naturally, the news media asked the president about the hearing's revelations during his weekly press conference. Specifically, one reporter asked, Mr. President, do you think that the Capitol Hill spy scare is a red herring to defer public attention from infl inflation, which was an important campaign issue at the time? Truman replied, yes, I do. The public hearings now underway are serving no useful purpose. On the contrary, they are doing irreparable harm to certain people seriously impairing the morale of federal employees and undermining public confidence in the government. And they are simply a red herring to keep from doing what they, Congress, ought to do. Truman's use of the word red herring was met with significant backlash. The phrase meant, quote unquote, something that is misleading or distracting. Reporter Robert Nixon stated, the president, in effect, was acknowledging that there was communism in the government and that some of the people in his administration and in the previous Roosevelt administration were traitors who had sold out their country to the Russian government. Congressman Kingsland Macy called the president's comments treasonable in spirit, while columnist H.L. Minken told Huak to, quote unquote, keep on Truman until keep on until Truman is booted out of the White House. Republican presidential candidate Thomas Dewey's campaign manager insinuated that Truman was quote unquote, seeming to cover up communist activity in the federal government. The most damning response, however, came from Republican Senator Homer Ferguson. Referring to the president's executive order 9835, which was previously mentioned, Ferguson, quote unquote, demanded that the administration start handing over the FBI files of government employees to congressional investigators. For Truman, this provided a difficult predicament. If he acquiesced, the privacy of at least, in his opinion, innocent federal employees would be violated. If he refused, Republicans would attack him for being weak on communism, or worse, for actively concealing communism in the federal government. Ultimately, Truman rejected the notion of turning over any FBI files on federal employees. While Ferguson did call for Congress to impeach the president, this obviously did not happen and merely just hurt Truman's perception in the eyes of conservatives. Uh, but the ordeal had the opposite effect for a senator from Wisconsin who is well known as Joseph McCarthy. Uh, Joseph McCarthy was a Republican senator from the state of Wisconsin from 1947 to 1957. Uh, McCarthy notably rose to prominence in February, 5th, not February 1950 when he told a Wheeling, West Virginia crowd that the State Department employed 205 card-carrying communists. In the subsequent days, however, following the State Department's denial and media circus that ensued, McCarthy revert not really reversed, but revised to 57, quote unquote, bad risk. And then later that same month, he stood in front of the American public and modified his claims again, uh, this time saying 81 loyalty risk. And he described them in a case by case analysis that went for over six hours. And while a majority of the cases involved palling around with communists, joining communist front organizations, or acting as Soviet agents, uh, two cases are uh, distinct for the purposes of this paper. Uh, the first was a quote-unquote flagrantly homosexual translator who was discharged because they were quote-unquote a bad security risk. Later, however, they were reinstated, reinstated uh, by a high State Department official. And then McCarthy went on to claim that the translator maintained, quote unquote, extremely close connections with other individuals with the same tendencies and thus represented a larger problem. According to McCarthy, these, quote unquote, very unusual individuals 
were active members of communist front organizations and sometimes active Soviet agents themselves. Then in the second case, McCarthy used the second instance, uh, in this case, an entire group of gay federal employees to further emphasize his overarching point that for him, it provided an interesting picture of some rather unusual mental twists of these gentlemen who were tied up with some of the communist organizations. Furthermore, in both cases, McCarthy took the time to describe an interaction he had with quote unquote, one of our top intelligence men in Washington. When McCarthy asked them what made communism so appealing to certain individuals, the intelligence officer responded, if you have been in this work long, as long as we have been, you would realize that there is something wrong with each one of these individuals. You will find that practically every active communist is twi twisted mentally or physically in some way. And then historian David K. Johnson states, historians of the McCarthy era often quote this twice told tale to demonstrate how membership, membership in the communist party was considered evidence of a psychological maladjustment in the 1950s. But the context of the story suggests that the claim was much more specific. Homosexuality, McCarthy asserted, was a psychological maladjustment that led people towards communism. And, but some have even kind of delved deeper and have speculated that McCarthy's uh, maxim of homosexuals can't be trusted may have at least partially been self-serving in nature. Uh, himself an unmarried man in his 40s, McCarthy, quote unquote, knew there were doubts about his own sexual prowess and preference. For example, journalist Drew Pearson knew of allegations that McCarthy sodomized one man and kissed another on the lips. And while Pierce never published these allegations, he did apparently tell a Las Vegas Sun publisher and editor uh, known as Hank Greenspun. Uh, and then later, Greenspun himself wrote uh, that, quote unquote, it is common talk among, hom among homosexuals in Milwaukee who rendezvous at the White House White Horse Inn that Senator Joe McCarthy has often engaged in homosexual, homosexual activities. Uh, perhaps even more serious for uh, McCarthy, however, was the FBI's investigation of his interactions with a particular army lieutenant. Um, and this lieutenant claimed that, quote unquote, when I was in Washington some time ago, McCarthy picked me up at, a, at the bar in the Wardman Hotel and took me home. And while I was half drunk, he committed sodomy on him, on me. Uh, ultimately, the uh, FBI did determine that this accusation was fake and fabricated because, quote unquote, the homosexuals are very bitter against Senator McCarthy for his attack upon those who are supposed to be in the government. Uh, while the lieutenant's accusation may have proven false, in my opinion, it's certainly plausible that the continuous rumors uh, regarding his own sexuality, in addition to his political ambitions, uh, those two factors may have fueled McCarthy's fervor uh, to remove gay federal employees from their employment. Um, and furthermore, they also had a strong impact on the 1952 presidential election, uh, which Eisenhower ended up being elected, um, which in this time in 1950, when, he, when McCarthy really rose to national prominence, um, Republicans had been out of power since uh, FDR had defeated uh, the incumbent Herbert Hoover uh, 18 years earlier. And since then, Roosevelt had served four terms, and then obviously Truman, uh, uh, his successor, uh, shocked, uh, in their opinion, the Republican establishment by defeating Thomas Dewey in 1948. Uh, Republicans were so confident of their victory in 48. Uh, in fact, that Dewey, quote unquote, barely campaigned and ignored the burgeoning issue of communists in government. Uh, thus, uh, in their opinion, they would not repeat the same mistake they made in 48 in the 52 election and thus utilize increasing public fear of communists infiltrating the federal government to propel Dwight uh, Eisenhower to office. Um, but while outspoken fear mongers such as McCarthy helped get Eisenhower elected. This once, uh, quote, this 
kind of symbiotic relationship kind of began to falter and become contentious uh, soon after Eisenhower took office as McCarthy uh, took aim at two of Eisenhower's key appointees uh, in his cabinet. Uh, and for all the FBI did to go kind of to the process of how appointees are approved, uh, the FBI conducts background checks on every one of Eisenhower's uh, White House appointees. Um, and this proved particularly problematic for Arthur, Arthur Vandenberg Jr., um, who was the son of a Republican U.S. Senator and campaign assistant who, uh, for Eisenhower, who Eisenhower designated as his personal secretary in the White House. And during, during the FBI's investigation in early December, the FBI actually learned of an associate of Vandenberg's who was arrested on a quote-unquote moral charge in uh, Lafayette Square, which is actually a place located across the street from the White House and at that time was known for quote-unquote homosexual activity. And uh, this associate had bounced out of the Navy. Um, it, I'm not entirely certain uh, why. I don't know if that information is uh, known, really, just that this unnamed person was kicked out of the Navy. Um, and then this memo was sent from the assistant director of the FBI to the associate director of the FBI, um, and it stated that the arrest ident individual uh, was was called was George Irwin or Irvin, um, and again, this this information is kind of spotty. That um, I don't know if it's been kind of changed or what, but allegedly they were sponsored by Arthur Vandenberg Jr. And subsequently, um, after this is starting to emerge, Vandenberg himself actually retreats from the public eye to quote unquote vacation in Florida. Um, and then later that month, uh, J. Edgar Hoover, the FBI director, um, privately met with Eisenhower uh, to discuss uh, his potential staff appointees and whatnot. And then obviously the discussion ended up turning to Vandenberg. And then later, uh, Hoover wrote on their conversation, uh, quote unquote, I told the general that Vandenberg had asked that we not interview the young man at present living with Vandenberg until he, Vandenberg, came out of the hospital to which he had gone for a physical check over the last weekend. Uh, the general told me that should Mr. Vandenberg decide that he did not desire to continue in the position to which he had been appointed as secretary to the president, that I could inform Vandenberg that no report would be submitted as it would be a moot question. Now, initially, Vandenberg kind of appeared to decline the implicit offer made by Eisenhower. Um, and this is kind of seen as on, in a letter that uh, on January 8th that Hoover wrote to Sherman Adams, um, Eisenhower's chief of staff, that their investigation of Vandenberg was complete and quote, unquote, there's attached a summary of these inquiries. Um, but this quickly uh, changed because five days later, Vandenberg formally notified uh, Eisenhower of his intention to withdraw from consideration. Uh, he wrote, in my eagerness to fill the post which you offered me, I have made every effort to overcome an adverse health condition. Uh, but I cannot longer delay in yielding to the fact that I will not be able to assume the duties of secretary to the president on January 20th. Therefore, I have no alternative except to request that you grant me an extended leave of absence from your staff. Um, and then Eisenhower wrote, uh, after reading the letter, I am distressed to learn of Arthur Vandenberg's illness. I sincerely hope he will have an early return to robust health. In this office, he will be greatly missed. Uh, but according to journalist Peter Schenkel, this comment kind of bolstered the illness storyline that uh, Vandenberg was trying to portray as for his reason for not taking the position publicly. And it, it kind of suggested that I could just learned about it. So this doesn't appear to at least have been a health condition that was long lasting. Um, and then 
a uh, few days later, while he was preparing for his inauguration, uh, Eisenhower actually wrote to uh, Vandenberg personally. And he wrote that when Mamie and I, his wife, go off to Washington this weekend, one of our greatest, re one of our great regrets will be that you are unable to be with us. I realize that you have been in this thing from the very beginning and that you have given tremendously of your energies during that period. On that account, I feel in some respects guilty. All of us are looking forward to you early return to vitality and health. Uh, Schinkel explains, though, uh, that this letter, which would remain secret for decades, suggests that while Ike sought to oust Vandenberg, once his connection with an alleged homosexual threatened it to become a political catastrophe, Eisenhower nonetheless reached out personally to express sorrow over the situation. Um, so again, that kind of shows that there doesn't appear to be a strong personal uh, reason as far as like not wanting Vandenberg on the staff because he was gay, because it, it really seem, does appear to be that the only reason was for political pressures and not, again, for a personal, perhaps religious reason um, that Eisenhower was against it. Um, and then another victim was uh, Charles Bolin also, and he was nominated uh, by Eisenhower for U.S. Ambassador to the Soviet Union. And uh, Bolin had ex extensive experience in the State Department as both a Foreign Service officer in Prague, Paris, and Moscow, and he also was uh, fluent in Russian. So on paper, definitely looked, looked like a, a pretty a good choice for uh, Eisenhower. And then he was also and this is important, he was also a translator and advisor to Roosevelt during the 1945 Yalta Conference. But despite all these accolades, uh, for someone like McCarthy, Bolin was, quote unquote, the epitome of the professional pinstriped Ivy League diplomat who exuded a kind of worldly cosmopolitanism, uh, cosmopolitanism that uh, drove McCarthy mad. <laughs> um, and then also, uh, a lot of conservatives uh, blamed those present at the Yalta conference, um, pretty much blame for quote unquote, surrendering Eastern Europe and Manchuria to Stalin at the meetings. And so that gave a lot of uh, cause for concern for uh, some conservatives. Um, and so Bolin kind of attempts to rationalize the decisions made at the Yalta conference when he is um, in his confirmation hearings in uh, March of 53 before the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. And um, ultimately, most were not convinced. Um, Republican Senator Stiles Bridges, uh, quote unquote, called on the president to withdraw Boland's name, while uh, Democratic Senator Pete McCarran claimed Boland's attendance at the conference was enough for uh, him to vote against his confirmation. And then Republican Senator Homer Ferguson also implored the executive branch to fill the post with another candidate. Um, Eisenhower, however, was uh, staunch in his support of Bolin uh, because he was, quote unquote, the best qualified man for the post, um, as we've discussed, very, very qualified. Um, but Eisenhower's uh, public support of Bolin obviously did not uh, dissuade McCarran and McCarthy from continuing their attack. As the two new kind of the general details of an FBI security review of Bolin. And this report kind of implied that Charles Thayer, uh, Bolin's brother-in-law and a fellow Foreign Service officer, was a homosexual. And furthermore, it, it kind of detailed, it, it outlined how the two had shared an apartment when they were both junior officers stationed in Moscow and that also Thayer was the one to introduce um, Bolden to his sister, who he ended up marrying. Um, and this, it, it kind of implied or implied that questions like whether Bolin knew of Thayer's sexuality, um, and if he did, did he cover it up, or were they in a relationship together? These kind of things that would obviously drive uh, uh, McCarran and uh, McCarthy just kind of insane. <laughs> I, I'm trying to think of another word, just they, they, they were not having it. Um, and then ultimately, 
the, the Senate confirmed Boland in a 74 to 13 vote um, after they had kind of found a workaround. They let one um, person from each party privately look at the document. Um, they didn't want to release it to public, so, so they let two designated people look at it and kind of give out what they thought. And so he was confirmed. And so even though Eisenhower got his appointee, um, he kind of felt like the entire situation was a waste of time and energy and actually wrote to his brother later that the FBI file was full of completely baseless, wholly unstantiated rumors that he had been associated some 15 or 20 years ago with some unsavory characters. Um, and then also Eisenhower wrote in his own personal uh, journal that McCarthy, uh, quote unquote, inflamed the situation in order to secure some mention of his name in the public press, which was definitely not an uncommon uh, thought from uh, McCarthy's opposition. But even though this relationship was contentious, Eisenhower never really challenged McCarthy uh, directly. Um, rather, he kind of tried to outflank McCarthy by instituting particular policies such as uh, Executive Order 10450. Uh, and uh, pretty much ex uh, Executive Order 10450 uh, required all federal agencies to investigate new and existing employees to quote unquote develop information as to whether the employment or retention employment in the federal service of the person being investigated is clearly consistent with the interest of national security. And uh, this information included quote unquote any criminal, infamous, dishonest, immoral, or notoriously disgraceful conduct, habitual use of intoxicants to excess, drug addiction, or sexual perversion. Uh, additionally, just in comparison to Truman's executive order, um, this included all federal employees, and it also eliminated the requirement that the individual be found disloyal, uh, quote unquote, to be terminated as security risk. Um, but while this order seemed to be more aggressive and um, it, it was mostly just a placator um, for a lot of people, especially the people that it was targeting, which in this case, we're talking about gay federal employees. Um, because for example, uh, Steve Benedict, who was an Eisenhower campaign member and also a federal employee at the time, uh, he, he wrote, I knew well that McCarthy and others had been on the war path for homosexuals in government well before Ike was in office. Uh, I think I regarded 10450 simply as part of the continuum, not as something that made any basic changes in what was already going on. I never had a reason to believe that Ike would use his capital to make a fight in this particular area. Uh, and, and again, this... It, Benedict's prediction ultimately did prove true. Um, I, I talk about it in my paper some, I'll kind of just skim it for time's sake. Uh, but pretty much in 1956, we have a case of Cole v. Young um, and a person, uh, uh, Kendra Cole, who works at the FDA, Food and Drug Administration, was terminated because, quote unquote, uh, his employment was not clearly consistent with the interests of national security. Um, and, and ultimately, the Supreme Court ruled that uh, they, they essentially restricted the application of 10450. Um, and that you can't just not, it, his determination was invalid because obviously not all government positions are concerned or affected with national security. And that just because this person, in this case, Cole had a connection to communism that has no impact on his job as an FDA um, employee. And so, yeah, in essence, my paper kind of, I'll try to narrow this down to 30 seconds. My paper discussed kind of how oftentimes we, we conflate religious beliefs of broader society in the United States at this time, their religious objections to homosexuality with the reason for these uh, programs. And really, it, it doesn't appear 
to, especially in the case of Truman and Eisenhower, that they personally had a problem with having gay federal employees. It really was just done for political purposes and with McCarthy, perhaps um, to dissuade people from thinking certain things about him. Thank you.